Most of what we call sin is stuff that we consider sin, and then when we do it, we violate our own conscience, and we're not actually feeling conviction from the Lord, we're feeling conviction from our conscience being violated because we had a set of rules that got taught into us. I understand. Uh, oh, I understand what you're saying. We're under a new covenant, the Grant Covenant. Yeah. I get that, and I believe that. But what does it mean when shall we continue in sin because we're under grace? And Romans 3:31 says, "Do we make void the law or nullify the law because we're under grace? God forbid. We establish the law. How do, can you explain that to me?" So. What I would start with is our definition of sin. Because there is an old covenant definition of sin, which is to violate the 613 laws, and we're under the new covenant. So then we have to know what the law of the new covenant is, and when we violate that, we're sinning. Does that make sense so far? If I was to say, if I was to carry on like the world, say, uh, I start drinking, swearing, cursing, stuff like that, sure. uh, and causing a new Christian to stumble, what would you say about that? I mean, uh, we don't want to profess to be one thing and act like another, another. So what do you say about that? So what I'm hearing so far would be your definition of sin. Um, what it says in Romans is that what is not of faith is sin. So there's going to be a, a challenging difference with the interpretation of what we consider sin. Um, Jesus made and drank alcohol, so I don't consider that sin. Jesus didn't consider that sin. But if we hold the concept that, well, certain things are sin, and I'm going to cause other people to stumble... Um, it would even go to um, Romans 14, 14, Paul says, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If you believe that drinking alcohol is sinful, when you drink alcohol, you will violate your conscience. To you it is sin because you believe it's sin, and now you're violating your own conscience. Are you violating God's law? Absolutely not. But are you violating what you understand? And most of what we call sin is stuff that we consider sin, and then when we do it, we violate our own conscience, and we're not actually feeling conviction from the Lord, we're feeling conviction from our conscience being violated, because we had a set of rules that got taught into us. If you know something's going to offend or make a new Christian stumble and see you're drinking a beer and they see you at a bar uh -huh. and then they say, oh, I thought you were a Christian. What are you doing here? Would you keep doing it? Would you say, oh, Jesus loves you. Come on and drink with me. What would you do? There's, there's very good approaches on both sides to this because there are leaders who will take the, the stance that says, I will not drink in front of anybody because I wouldn't want to cause anyone to stumble. It's a classic approach, and there's that camp that takes that approach. There's the, um, the, the approach of maybe not even a new Christian, maybe they're an alcoholic who struggled, and now they've gotten clean and sober, and you don't want to step on their toes and offend them either. And for the person that maybe they've gone through a 12-step program and they've accomplished it and they're spending years sober, they have a definition of freedom. And in their definition of freedom, they've achieved freedom. They've achieved sobriety. They've gone through the whole process, and they are free. I don't believe that that is what the highest level of freedom is. I also know other individuals who they were an alcoholic. They went through this process, 
And then they, they, they accomplished the 12 steps and they came to the point of knowing their identity and their freedom in the new creation that they actually are now able to drink with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is self-control. So if I were to teach a new believer, I would say, yes, Christians can drink, but we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit called self-control, and the Bible teaches us to be sober and not to be drunkard, but it doesn't teach us that we can't drink alcohol. So I would want to teach them true freedom. It's not a matter of causing them to stumble. Causing to stumble is usually when we go to the point of like, oh, everything's okay. Everything is fine. Drunkenness isn't a problem. Then I am causing them to stumble, and that I would not want to do. I, I hope that helps. Where are we next? Over here. All right. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, the rebuilding of the temple, the third temple in Jerusalem, uh, yeah. Isaiah prophesied in the latter days, you know, where the Lord go forth from the temple area, the, the Jerusalem. How does that sync up with uh, what you're talking about, but the temple's gone and there's no, I mean, the Jews think the third temple's going to be rebuilt, and a lot of people think it's going to usher in the second coming of Christ, and so on and so forth. So I'd be interested in your thought on Great question. Perfect. I got what you're saying. So um, for those who might be missing it, he's asking about what about a future third temple being built in Jerusalem and the eschatological belief that that's a part of the end time scenario. Um, Dr. Tommy Ice of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture Institute, which is a real thing and exists on the campus of Liberty University. He's one of the most well-known uh, pre-trib rapture individuals in the world, has written in his book with all honesty that there is not one scripture in the Bible that says there will be a third rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. That's coming from that side, that point of view, and being honest, intellectual integrity, that that is not a reality. What that happens is we pick up verses from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, which all predate the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. And they talk about a rebuilding. And it did happen under Ezra and Nehemiah. When we drag those verses out of their context, which had to do with the destruction under, under Babylon and the rebuilding under Ezra and Nehemiah, and then we have to create a third temple to actually fulfill those verses that were already fulfilled once before. That would be my answer. Once saved, always saved, okay. right? Versus you can lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. So how does that all work as the bride of Christ? God judging goat nations and sheep nations, is that even a thing anymore, right? In the mm -hmm. context that salvation is individual. Um, let me start with sheep and goats because it's the quickest, easiest one. Um, this comes from Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. It's not sheep and goat nations. That phrase has been created in the last about 15 years in the charismatic world. It's become a whole thing about, uh, is America a sheep nation or are we a goat nation? Actually, what he's saying in verse 32, all the nations, which is ethnos, all people, all ethnicities, Jews, Gentiles, every human being will be brought before his throne and the people, he will separate the people one from another. Individuals will be separated one from another as a shepherd would do with sheep and goats. Not the nations will be separated like, okay, all the Colombians over here, you had a bad president, so you are a goat nation. I, 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 used to under, I used to really believe the sheep and goat nation concept, uh, and yet the more you start to think about it, you go, wait a second, okay, so what if I have dual citizenship? 
They're like, ah, I'm going to be with those guys on the day of judgment. What if you change your citizenship? Does that help you with your day of salvation before the throne? What makes you a sheep nation? 51% Christian? Now you're a sheep nation. But what if they're not all the same denomination as you? Because we know they're not all as Christian as I am. So is it just numerical, or does it have to be qualitatively sheep, or... See, what we did, we took this, we created a concept, and there are sheep nations and there are goat nations, and that's not in the passage at all. It's just not there. What we have are we have individuals who are separated from all nations standing before the throne, separated as individuals as a sheep or a goat. That's what the passage tells us. So we have that one. Um, the idea of um, once saved, always saved, the challenge with that is that in a covenant, you do actually have a, a say. You actually are a part of something, and it's not like God takes over your free will, and now you are saved permanently. There is still a reality, and we see it in all of the New Testament letters where he's encouraging them to contend for the faith of our fathers, to stay in the faith, to pursue the Lord, to know the Lord, not to fall away, don't to be like those who go back, but to press forward. Why does he waste all that time on that stuff? Once saved, always saved. Not true. The reality is you have an actual relationship and when you step into Christ, it doesn't mean, now you're trapped. You still have a choice to remain in Christ. And we've seen people who made a bad choice about that. What he wants is a real relationship. If, if people ask now, how do I present the gospel? You messed up my whole courtroom scene. <laughs> I don't even know how to give the gospel anymore because of this new covenant stuff. You go to Luke 15 and you look at the prodigal son story. The father has forgiven the son before he even came home. The son is already forgiven. What, what I, I didn't touch on this, but I, I will for a moment here. Everybody on the planet is forgiven. And hell is going to be filled with people that God forgave. See, where we get this warped universalism is if they're all forgiven, everybody goes to heaven. Nonsense. What actually happens is everybody was forgiven because it says in, in 1 John 2, 2, he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. So he's, sin he's died for everybody, he's forgiven everybody, and he's like the father in the prodigal son story, longing for the son to come home so that they can have relationship. The son's already forgiven. So you can go out and present the gospel as, do you understand that God has forgiven you already? And he wants a relationship with you. He loves you. He's longing for you to come home. But we usually start with, do you understand how horrible you are? And ah, and we start with that. And then we try to walk him through. But, you know, he took your place. You totally were going to go to the cross and you were going to go to hell and you were going to. Ah. Instead of, uh, hey, I know that you've been rolling around with pigs. I know that you smell that. I know this probably isn't who you want to be. Do you know that there's a loving father who puts you on this planet for a reason? Evolution didn't create you. You're not some cosmic accident, but there's a creator who really loves you and wants a relationship with you. Are you interested to get to know him? <laughs> yes. Who is he? That's the actual presentation. The father wants to know you, and he wants you to come home and have relationship. We get to the end of the story. They've celebrated the one son. He goes out and talks to the other son, and the story ends. We don't know if the older son changed his heart and went into the party. 
We also don't know if the younger son stayed. He might have had a great party, had a great week. Insecurity, fear, this stuff kicked in. Maybe he really liked the pigs. Maybe he was having a good time and he was drawn back and he could leave his father's house again. We don't know that part of the story, but that's the part of the story we live where we get to choose to stay at the father's house and recognize his love and his kindness that led us to repentance. So we still get to make that choice and we get to live here or we can go back out to the pigsty again. But in either case, we're already forgiven. That's not the issue. So the idea of even, this is where the idea of the unforgivable sin comes in. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin. How could there be anything of an unforgivable sin, right? How could that thing even exist if everything's forgiven? The idea of the unforgivable sin is you rejecting forgiveness. I could, I could have a, a, a challenge with Annie. We have this break in our friendship of some sort where there's an offense, and I, I come to her and say, I forgive you, which usually is not a great way to approach anything. <laughs> We're good because I forgave you. Uh, <laughs> Men, don't try that. Um, so the idea that, that uh, she's forgiven, that's true. Okay, I've forgiven her. But she can say, I don't want your forgiveness. Well, that's unforgivable because I can't get, I can't jam forgiveness into her. I can offer it, but the only time that unforgivable sin would happen is that she doesn't receive the forgiveness and she pushes away from it. It's not a, an action of any other sort on her part. It's not that she does something so offensive and so hurtful that it's unforgivable. God is not like, oh, well, you know, you, you were mean to, to Billy and, and that I can forgive, but you murdered three people. I cannot forgive her that. It's not a weight of different things. He'll forgive absolutely both and anything and everything. It's all pre-forgiven, but you have to receive it. And if we push away and we don't receive it, then we can't receive forgiveness, which makes it unforgivable. You are literally unforgivable because you won't take it. Is there a temple in heaven? Call out your answer. Is there a temple in heaven? Yes, no. You're both right. In Revelation 20, 21, 22, it talks about in heaven there is no sea. And it talks about the old heaven and the old earth passing away and a new heaven and a new earth existing and a new Jerusalem and a bride. And in this picture, it says that there is no temple in heaven for Jesus is the light of the temple. He's the light of the city, not the temple. But back in Revelation 11, he says, and the temple in heaven was opened and thunders and lightnings and peals of, of lightning and they saw the Ark of the Covenant. So there's a temple and there's not a temple. Because what we're actually reading about in Revelation is two heavens. There is the heaven where God lives and he has his throne, and there is a temple there, and the Ark of the New Covenant exists there. And between the Father and the Son, and that's where the blood was, and the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews tells us there is a temple, there is a heavenly sanctuary, that Moses copied it. So it does exist. But then you get over to this New Jerusalem, which we think of as the afterlife. We think of the New Jerusalem, the Bride of Christ, and we think of these as the afterlife. We read Revelation 21 and 22 as the afterlife, right? And there, there's no temple. And there it talks about there's a river, and the river has trees 
and everywhere the river goes, it brings life, and that the trees have leaves which are for the healing of the nations. If, if the final judgment when it happens after that is Revelation 21 and 22, so the final judgment has happened, and now you're in the New Jerusalem, why are there nations that need healing? Why do we need special leaves or fruit that will heal the nations? It's after the final judgment. Or after the final judgment, because the final judgment, it seems, is in Revelation 20. If, if the final judgment has happened, then why are there, does the new Jerusalem have gates that remain open and outside are murderers and dogs and slanderers and the doors remain open day and night? Seems like New Jerusalem's in a bad neighborhood or something. <laughs> I just leave those gates open and those guys can wander in. And they're not in hell. It's after the final judgment. They're supposed to be in hell. And it tells us that the new Jerusalem, which is the new heavens, the new earth, and the bride, that the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. So heaven came out of heaven? It's a little complicated in the end of the book of Revelation. What we're actually seeing, and we've seen it in Hebrews, we've seen it in Matthew 5, we've seen it in Matthew 24, we've seen it in uh, uh, Galatians 4, is that the new Jerusalem is the new covenant. So the new Jerusalem that you see at the end of the book of Revelation is a description, a visionary description of the new covenant reality. In that new covenant reality, the doors of the new covenant remain open to the unbeliever to come in. The light of the city draws the kings of the earth to come in. The leaves that we have in the new covenant are for the healing of the nations. Inside this system, this is why he even says, Behold, I am making all things new. It's an ongoing progressive progression of making all things new. Why would he still be making all things new after the final judgment in our future eternal destination? He could say, I've made all things new. I did a great job. Done. So the picture of the new Jerusalem that John is laying out in that revelation is that there is this water that flows out and it heals. And as Jesus talked about, come to the water and drink and you receive eternal life. John is just giving a very pictorial vision of this. Some people say, are you saying there's no heaven? No, what I'm saying is there is a heaven where God lives and there's an Ark of the Covenant and there is a new covenant and there is a temple there. And that place, out of it came the new covenant. Out of it came the new Jerusalem. Out of it came a new heaven and new earth that doesn't have a bronze laver out front called the sea. And what is the new temple? You are. That's why this new heaven, new earth, new covenant doesn't have a temple, because I'm the temple. My body is now the temple, and your body is now the temple. And we are the ones who release the light everywhere we go. Yeah.